All right, I think we're ready now. <laughs> Thank you again for being here. Uh, if you're a business owner, you're in the wrong place. Um, if you're a real estate professional, you're in the right place. So. Of course, we'd say that we're all business owners. That's right. <laughs> The collapse of the housing bubble in 2008 triggered one of the worst economic recessions in American history. Americans lost over $9 trillion in home equity. Many of you here today may have lost business or maybe even your house during the crisis. The bad news for us today is that the government's response, Dodd-Frank, has done absolutely nothing to stop that from happening again. As I mentioned before, my name is Wesley Coopersmith. I work as the education coordinator here at Heritage Action, and I'm in charge of the uh, Sentinel programs that you, that you guys are a part of and hopefully, hopefully still enjoying um, as we enter our second panel. Uh, the title of this afternoon's panel is called Get the Government Out of the Housing Market, Repeal Dodd-Frank and End GSEs. The purpose of the panel is to determine what really caused the economic crisis of 2008, how the government's response was entirely misguided, and what Congress should do now to fix it. Many conservative real estate professionals here today know, know firsthand the dangers of government intervention in the housing market. The housing bubble and subsequent collapse of the financial markets in 2008 was in part caused by government efforts to artificially expand home ownership regardless of the financial risk. Government-sponsored enterprises like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, along with FHA affordable housing efforts, artificially expanded home ownership to unsustainable levels. From 1990 to 2003, Fannie and Freddie went from holding an astonishing amount of debt at nearly $8 trillion. They went from holding 5% of the nation's mortgages to over 20%, leading up to the crisis. Once homeowners started defaulting on their monthly payments at above average rate, it became clear Fannie and Freddie would collapse. Many low-income and first-time homebuyers lost their homes, while Fannie and Freddie enjoyed a $200 billion bailout from U.S. taxpayers. Many politicians and pundits at the time, and still today, blame greedy Wall Street for the collapse. So in 2010, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act under the guise of consumer protection and punishing Wall Street. But instead of addressing the root cause, which was bad government policy, Dodd-Frank empowered the very regulatory establishment which created the environment that led to the crisis in the be to begin with. Dodd-Frank composes thousands of pages of new rules and regulations on the financial industry, codifies too-big-to-fail policy, harms local community banks, despite what the White House likes to say, restricts access to credit for investors and home buyers, raises lending costs, reduces access to capital for small businesses, and has created one of the most unaccountable federal agencies in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Dodd-Frank is one of the major factors responsible for the country's historic economic slow recovery. Congress must act quickly and decisively to get rid of Dodd-Frank and get the economy going again. Before I introduce the distinguished panelists with us here today, let me first mention a few quick, quick housekeeping items. Uh, each panelist will get roughly five minutes. We might go over because uh, the last panel was so great. Uh, to provide opening remarks. Following that, I'll ask a few more questions to keep the conversation going, and then we'll open it up to you guys with your questions. Um, please wait for the mic to come to you. We are recording this, um, and please make sure you do ask, ask a question. So with us today to my immediate left is Norbert Michel, the Heritage Foundation's Research Fellow in Financial Regulations. Norbert studies and writes about financial markets and monetary policy, including the reform of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Working in Heritage's Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies, Norbert also focuses on the best way to address difficult difficulties at large financial companies, the too-big-to-fail problem. Before rejoining Heritage in 2013, Norbert was a tenured professor at Nichols State University College of Business, teaching finance, economics, and statistics at the AACSB accredited school in Louisiana. His earlier stint heritage was as a tax policy analyst in the think tank Center for Data Analysis from 2002 to 2005. He previously was with the global energy company Energy, where he built a logistic recession model to help predict bankruptcies for commercial clients. His work allowed Energy to better monitor monetary losses caused by customers' delinquent payments. Norbert holds a doctorate degree in financial economics from the University of New Orleans he received his Bachelor of Business Administration degree in Finance and e Economics from Loyola University. Um, to his left is uh, Mark Calabria, PhD. 
He is a director of finance regulation studies at the Cato Institute. Before joining Cato in 2009, Mark spent seven years as a member of the senior professional staff of the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs. In that position, he handled issues related to monetary policy, housing, mortgage finance, economics, banking, and insurance for Senator Richard Shelby. During his service on Capitol Hill, Mark drafted significant por portions of the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008, which established a new regulatory regime for the government-sponsored enterprises. Prior to his service on Capitol Hill, Mark served as Deputy Assistant Re uh, Secretary for Regulatory Affairs at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and also held a variety of positions at Harvard University's Joint Center for Housing Studies, the National Association of Home Builders, and the National Association of Realtors. Mark has also been a research associate with the U.S. Census Bureau Center for Economic Studies. His writings have appeared on the op-ed pages of the New York Post, National Review, USA Today, Orange County Register, Investors, Investors Business Daily, Washington Times, Cleveland Plain Dealer, and Barron's, among others. Mark also makes frequent appearances on CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, BBC, and BNN. He holds a doctorate degree in economics from George Mason University. To his left, we have Diana Katz. Diana is a, se a senior research fellow in regulatory policy with the Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies. Diane joined Heritage five years ago after serving as Director of Risk, Environment, and Energy Policy for the Fraser Institute, Director of Science, Environment, and Technology for the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, and is a member of the Detroit News Editorial Board, specializing in science and the environment, tele telecommunications and technology, and the auto industry. Diane has been the recipient of several fellowships, including the Jack R. Howard Science Reporting Institute at the University Institute of Technology and the Policy Economic Research Center in Bozeman, Montana. She has testified before Congress, as well as numerous state legislators, and has been published by the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Times, National Review, the Weekly Standard, Reason Magazine, and dozens of regional and local newspapers. Diane was awarded a Bachelor's of Philosophy degree from Thomas Jefferson College and a Master's degree from the University of Michigan. Please join me in welcoming our guests. All right, Norbert, if you want to kick us off. Okay, thanks, Wes. Thank you all for being here, too. I, uh, I've had the, the privilege of working at Heritage twice, once under a regime that did not have Heritage Action, and this time, of course, we do have Heritage Action. Uh, and the fact that we do and that we have a Sentinel program and these sorts of things, um, that was one of the deciding factors for me to come back. I, I think this is much better this way. I like what we're doing. So, Or you're doing. We're separate. Um, thank you. So, <laughs> yes. So uh, I, I will speak a little bit about the Financial Choice Act, which is in the news today. There was just a markup on the Hill today, as many of you probably know. The bill's gotten quite a bit of attention because of what it does to Dodd-Frank, and I'm, I'm going to just run through that very quickly. But before I do that, I just want to point out that it actually does more than just repeal and replace parts of Dodd-Frank. Um, and, and some of those things that it does, aside from Dodd-Frank, I think are more important uh, than some of what it does to Dodd-Frank, or at least as important. The, the truly innovative policy idea is something, in, in this bill, is something that we've been advocating for, or it's a version of something that we've been advocating for for a couple of years now. Uh, it's sometimes called a regulatory off-ramp. And the idea is, if you absorb more of your own risk, we let you out of these regulations. And exactly how that plays out can be done in many different ways. Uh, but basically what this bill does is it requires a bank to hold, well, it doesn't require. It offers a bank a chance to get out of some regulation if it funds itself with higher equity. So it basically just says if you absorb your own risk, you cover your own losses, we don't have to regulate you as much as we've been doing before. And that's, I think, one of the, the things that we need to push um, across many different kinds of, of financial regulatory reforms. I think it should be the centerpiece of, of any sort of reform movement that we have. Uh, so that's one of the things I'm really excited about. Uh, the other thing that it does, not related to Dodd-Frank really, is it, it enacts the, uh, the FORM Act, the Fed Oversight Reform Monetary Something Act. It's a monetary policy act, and it, uh, it, it, it 
the, the easy way of talking about this is that it, it actually increases the transparency with which the Fed has to conduct monetary policy. So it's sort of a, a rules-based monetary policy change, and it's been sort of mischaracterized as forcing the Fed to employ a Taylor rule, if you're familiar with that, and that's not really what it does. But it does make the Fed justify what they do, which monetary policy decisions they, they make, uh, as well as some other changes. Uh, so I think those are the those are two of the big things that are, are wins, no matter what else it does. Now, in terms of Dodd Frank, what does it do to Dodd Frank? It re all but repeals Title One. Uh, Title One created the Financial Stability Oversight Council, the FSOC. Uh, that's a group of regulators that is responsible for designating uh, what we call systemically important financial institutions for special regulations, and the sort of uh, fun way of talking about that is they identify the firms that are too big to fail. Obviously, if you want a policy that gets rid of too big to fail, you probably don't want to have the federal government identifying the firms that are too big to fail. But that's what Title I of Dodd-Frank does. The Financial Choice Act would eliminate that problem. That's obviously huge. It also repeals Title II of Dodd-Frank, which is orderly liquidation, which is what keeps those large financial companies out of bankruptcy, which is the opposite of what we should be doing. We should be having, we, we should have a bankruptcy process for those firms. Financial Choice Act also gives us one of those. Uh, it, it adapts the Financial Institution Bankruptcy Act of 2016, which actually already passed the House. So it incorporates that same legislation. Uh, and actually, it passed the House by voice vote, so it, it was not controversial, even though this bill is going to be crushed as being controversial. Um, Choice Act also repeals Title VIII of Dodd-Frank, which is sort of a specialized version of Title I of Dodd-Frank. Just so it's, it's for something called the financial market utility, um, sort of like a payment and clearing company kind of thing, clearinghouse. And it kind of goes with Title I, so the Choice Act gets rid of both of them. It does not repeal Title X, which is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB, uh, which would much rather see that it would do that. But it does rewrite it in a, in a fairly constructive way. It drastically modifies the, the way the CFPB exists. It creates, it, it, it converts it over to a, uh, a, a bipartisan commission like the other regulators that we have which is better than what we have in the CFPB now. And it puts it on appropriations, um, which is also better than what we have now. And it narrows its mission uh, quite a bit. One of the things that it does that's really important is it removes its authority to, uh, to ban products or services that are deemed abusive, which is obviously ill-defined and uh, much broader than what's already in, what, what was in law before Dodd-Frank. Uh, so, that's important, it does that. Not a complete win, but somewhat of a win. In addition to that, it gets rid of the FDIC's Emergency Loan Guarantee Authority. Uh, it also restricts the Fed's Emergency Lending Authority, and that's kind of Title 11 of Dodd-Frank, but they did have some authority before Dodd-Frank, so that's, that's a trickier one. It repeals, <clears throat> excuse me, it repeals the Volcker Rule, which is proprietary trading in the banks. That's Title VI of Dodd-Frank. Uh, there are other things in Title VI of Dodd-Frank that probably could come out, but that's the most important one, I think. So that's also a win. Uh, it makes many smaller capital market improvements, uh, little boring things like SEC processes, uh, rulemaking, uh, and also small businesses' ability to raise capital in mm -hmm. public markets. So there's a lot of SEC stuff there. It creates a SEC registered venture exchange, which is specifically designed for very small businesses to be able to raise money. Uh, big problem that we have now. Uh, it also exempts crowdfunding securities from some of the SEC rules that essentially make it non-existent in public markets for small companies. So those two things by themselves are also very big changes that should be beneficial. In addition to that, it implements the RAINS Act on all the financial regulators. So any major financial regulation would have to be affirmatively approved by Congress as opposed to only having it implemented by a supposedly independent agency. Um, yeah, I already said that one. Um, it also strips the Fed's, doesn't, does not strip the Fed's regulatory authority, which we would like it to do, but it does 
carve it out as sort of a next step to get there. And it puts their non-monetary budget, uh, their non-monetary function on budget. So as a regulator, the Fed now has to go through the appropriations process, which would be an enormous change. Uh, it also repeals the Durbin Amendment, uh, the, the debit interchange fee price control. And then there are also several smaller, or maybe not smaller, but fraud, securities fraud penalty provisions that are in the act that it does strengthen. And that's pretty much my highlight version. And before we started, Alexa had a paper uh, that I, I believe she was handing out to you guys that, that, that we just had published here that does get into a little bit more detail. It also offers some ways that the, the bill could be improved. Um, and I think I could just stop right there. Yeah. <laughs> Mark. Okay, good well, part. I was, I was enjoying the thought of Diane being on my left. I was, <laughs> I was actually waiting for Wes to say, and on our far left. Um, but I'm so far left, I'm right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. But, but let me first, first say I appreciate, I, I know it's quite unusual to have a non-heritage person speak, and so I'm really flattered by the invitation. Uh, I often feel like uh, I'm part of the team, given how much Norbert and Diane work together, and you guys really do have a, a great team over here. Um, That's why we love Mark. Yeah, I, I generally think about it on a regular basis, whether I should just try to hire away Norbert and Diane, but I can't afford them, so, um, so you've got them for a little bit longer. Uh, let me mention as well, as you, as you gathered from, um, probably from my bio, other than the fact that from my bio it sounds like that I can't keep a job regularly, but that's not. really old. <laughs> are really old, one of the two. I don't want to. I don't want to face either of those. But uh, maybe this will sound maybe sound even a little older. Um, so for the last better part of the last twenty years, I basically spent my time trying to fix our mortgage finance system in one way or another. And to put that in context, it was thirteen years ago, essentially this month, we started working on Shelby's first bill to fix Fannie and Freddie that I was part of thirteen years ago. Uh, one of the things I really want to emphasize with that, too, is anybody who tells you they did not see the failure of Fannie and Freddie coming or the housing crisis coming, well, there were those of us who did. Uh, unfortunately, we could not get the votes to move forward on that effort, uh, but I think Senator Shelby particularly deserves a lot of credit for um, a lot of fight at that time trying to avoid the situation we're in today. Um, unfortunately, uh, I don't think the next crisis is going to be a surprise either. I think certainly we all know that the housing cycle is not over. There will be times when prices are going to go down again, as painful as that sounds. And there are going to be times when borrowers are underwater again, and there are going to be times when sales dry up again. And there are going to be times when lenders pull back on credit. Uh, unfortunately, one big difference between now and then is despite the very little amounts of capital that Fannie and Freddie had before the crisis, they had some. Today, they essentially have none. So to put it in context, we've got about five trillion in risk from Fannie and Freddie, about a trillion and a half risk from FHA. All of this is directly backed by the taxpayer with essentially no backstop at all. Uh, you can throw in, if you throw in Ginnie Mae, I think to put it in context, if you look at the amount of risk in the mortgage market that the taxpayer stands behind, this is about equal to the market cap of all 3,000 some companies on the NASDAQ. That's how much you as a taxpayer are on the hook for if things go wrong. I don't want to over exaggerate. Obviously there are houses there. Obviously there's value there. Obviously, you know, I mean, I, I guess I could put it this way. Worst case scenario, we might lose a trillion. <laughs> Obviously, not. that's still a whole lot of money. Um, so I, 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 don't, I certainly don't want to um, say that we're going to lose as much of that. Uh, FHFA, Fannie and Freddie's regulator, recently put out a report that in their estimate during the next downturn, Fannie and Freddie could need about as much as $125 billion. Um, I think that's actually an underestimate, but, I th but it's certainly a reasonable starting point. We could need as much as $30 billion for FHA if things go seriously wrong. I'm going to come back to a little later why I think FHA is in worse shape today than it was in 10 years ago before the last crisis. Uh, maybe the cut to the chase, it's because most of subprime basically moved into FHA, which is, I think many, many of you know. Um, so to Fannie and Freddie's credit, more or less, they did increase their credit quality. The typical Fannie and Freddie loan is better today than it was 10 years ago. That's a positive thing. Uh, but again, that's because most of that lending has gone to FHA instead. 
which I don't think is a very good thing. To give you some uh, picture of this, uh, for so far for 2016, over 70% of FHA loans have loan to values over 95%. So very little cushion. Um, you know, and, and one of the small things we got done in here in 2008, this, this surprises me even before the time, and we, the fact that we had to fight for this, so we got a provision put in law that you couldn't do an FHA where the total, you know, closing costs all in was over 100% LTV. And the fact that we, you could pre-crisis, you could get up to like 103% LTV with an FHA loan. The, the fact, yeah, yeah, so the fact we had to fight people for that, that it was considered radical to suggest that nobody get the loan where they're underwater at the closing table. Um, or at least have the, have the taxpayer back it. I should certainly say, um, you know, as, a, as an ardent, hardcore free marketer, you know, make whatever loan you want if your own mo money is at risk. You know, if it's a seller finance deal and you want to lend somebody 110% of the property, more power to you. But when the taxpayer is on the hook, I think we've got to have responsible underwriting standards where the borrower has something at risk too. So I mentioned the 95% LTV issue. Perhaps more than troubling to me, about a fifth of um, FHA Today's most recent book, under 640 FICO. Mm. Um, there's even a little bit under under 580, and so we have not gotten worse uh, the, the subprime. I think I can say it in front of this crowd, because in, in some crowds this, this might sound insensitive remark, but I like to say that um, you don't get a 580 FICO without trying. <laughs> 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 and, and so, unfortunately, there really is this attitude, and I, and I would tell you one of the most shocking things to me in Washington on a regular basis is, if you have this conversation with people, the attitude among policymakers is somehow it's like you woke up one morning with the subprime, you know, flu, you know. Norbert sneezed, I caught a 580. But, you know, we know that it doesn't actually work that way in the real world. Um, and I'm not being unsympathetic to, you know, I understand lots of people have a bump in the road. You might have a medical expense. You might have divorce or something like that. I suspect one or two of you in the room know about that. And that could really make a ding on your credit. But again, all that disappears after seven years. All of that you can work toward a path of getting your credit back together. And I think one of the mistakes before the crisis was there really was this sense and you got to get people in now or they're going to lose that on the appreciation. And so I'm, I'm, very, I'm a homeowner. I'm actually in the process of buying a second home, so I'm keeping you guys all, all employed. Um, but I think there has to be sort of, if we're going to get someone into home ownership, if they come in with a, a 580, you know, or even a 640, the question should be, how do we take six months and help you get your, get your act back together? And that's all doable. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you know that, but I, I think the focus of kind of just taking it slow, I, I think, is important. Um, Diane's going to talk about the CFPB, but I'm going to, at a couple of spots, steal a little bit of her thunder, but not, not too much of it. Um, it. One of the things, and Norbert touched upon Dodd-Frank, but one of the things that drives me crazy is when I hear that, well, we don't really need to hear, worry about the mortgage market because Dodd-Frank fixed all that. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that all the time in Washington. Unfortunately, I hear that from sophisticated financial reporters who should know better, too, is you know what's false. Um, there's this real intentional, in my opinion, ignoring of what drives mortgage default. And again, I think common sense tells you, but we've got a lot of independent studies, GAO and others have done a lot of studies, and we really know that, like for instance, you know, you can do a pay, you know, a, a, a pay option arm or whatever you want. If that borrower's got 800 FICO and, they're, and they put 20% down, I don't care what the loan looks like, that person's gonna pay you back. If they've got a 620 FICO and they put nothing down, I don't care if it's a 30 year fixed or whatever, that's a high risk loan. And so the narrative in Washington, the narrative Dodd-Frank is that it's not about the bar where everybody really wants to pay, nobody ever doesn't pay, it's because we got them in bad loans. And of course we know that's not true and we know lots of people like the self-employed, for instance many in the real estate industry, responsibly use low documentation loans. Um, so we know that the products that we're going after, uh, the features that we went after in Dodd-Frank were the wrong features. It, even more troubling to me, and I think we saw this, and, and, and again, if you've ever looked at a chart comparing delinquency times in, uh, sta in states where you need to get a judicial foreclosure versus administrative foreclosure, massive difference. And so one of the responses in Washington after the crisis was, well, you know, if we just keep people in the home long enough, you know, it'll all work out. Uh, and I think you know many of this, that the, the, it got to many places like Chicago, median time to foreclosure was over a thousand days after somebody stopped paying the mortgage. And so again, you know, and again, I don't want to say, you know, 
Norbert and I, as economists, we sometimes get a laugh out of the fact, and I guess we sometimes indulge this too, that economists spend a lot of high-powered thinking and time to prove basically that water runs downhill. Um, and one of the things that they spent a lot of time proving is that, wow, if you let people get more and more free rent essentially in a property, they're more likely to default. Again, that's common sense, but unfortunately we've had to repeatedly learn that the hard way. One of the real problems, in my opinion, about the qualified mortgage and the qualified residential mortgage, but particularly the qualified mortgage in Dodd-Frank is, if there is any T that's not crossed or I that's not dotted in the document, it can be a bar to foreclosure. And so if, any, if you think it was hard to foreclose last time, if you think there was a lot of overhang in the market, you ain't seen nothing yet. And it's really going to be bad. Now, of course, this is one of the reasons why the lenders have over-responded and said we're going to have credit overlays, if we're not going to make these risky loans if we're not going to be able to foreclose. Um, but again, foreclosure is going to be very, very difficult. I think, as you know, when you're trying to sell a property and somebody's been in the house down the street for three years and they're not fixing the lawn, they're not maintaining the property, that is not good for the neighborhood, it's not good for the sales. And quite frankly, you know, I often sort of paint, paint the example of, you know, if you were a carpenter in Tampa, you lost your job when the housing market went bust, you know, is it really right for us to sort of incentivize you to stay in place or is it right for us to encourage you to move to Dallas or Atlanta where the jobs are being created? This was the first recession in American history where the mobility of homeowners declined in the recession rather than increased. Now, I'm not su suggesting we got to go back to 1930s Dust Bowl, everybody moved to California. That's not what we need. But the fact that we locked people in place with our mortgage response policies by essentially saying, we'll let you stay there to essentially you get back on your feet. And of course, as we also know, a lot of the things like the HARP and HAMP and all of these programs were tied to your level of income. And so the more you made, the less mortgage release you got. And what was the outcome of that was very, very strong incentives for people not to work if they wanted to not pay their mortgage. And that was a contributor to the very weak recovery. So again, we see a lot of this. Uh, I think this is underappreciated, and I only mentioned it, so maybe Diane will talk about it or not talk about it. But I think one of the things you really take a look at that CFPB is going the direction of is the new servicing rules. Yep. This is really going to be a hit. Uh, and again, from the economist perspective, it will make the next housing downturn worse and it will drag out the next housing downturn with any given level of house price decline. Um, so I will let me mention really quickly that uh, Congress has tried to do some things on Fannie Freddie FHA reform. Uh, most of this has come from Republicans. There's been a little bit from Democrats. Uh, Henserlein, who is the author of the Choice Act that Norbert talked about, is also the author last Congress of the PATH Act. And the Senate, you had senators, uh, mostly uh, Corker and Crapo, sort of take the lead on trying to do GSA reform. Well, let me say, I'll start with the Senate. I guess since I'm a former Senate staffer, I'll start with my own biases a little bit. Um, despite the best intentions, I think what Senator Corker and Senator Crapo put forth the last Congress was just not very good, to be generous about it. Um, but I think the part of it, the, the, the reason it's not very good is they really didn't start from a basic premise of why did the system fail and why do we need to fix it. You know, they started with we have a political problem, you know, the name Fannie Mae is toxic, we're kind of embarrassed, we really don't want to change the system, but how do we do this, you know, to make the American people think we're basically changing the system. Exactly. And what they set up was a very convoluted insurance type system where the government was where the government was still on the on the hook. And of course they were obsessed with, and I get it in this environment, obsessed with being bipartisan. You know, my attitude is if it's good, be bipartisan, but don't let that be the sacrifice of a good bill. I'm not against working with Democrats if they've got a good proposal in front of me, but I don't think your objective should be bipartisanship for bipartisanship's sake. And sometimes some of our friends on the Republican side of the Senate get a bit caught up in that. Uh, I'll say one of the things I always appreciate from working with Senator Shelby was he always reminded us that sometimes nothing's the best outcome. And don't just take a deal to get a deal done. Uh, and again, some of our friends on the Hill forget that. Um, <laughs> so Henserling's bill, in my opinion, was, was, was much better. Uh, certainly in my opinion, I don't think it went far enough in getting guarantees off the table. He largely left FHA in place with some tweaks, did try to transition Fannie and Freddie uh, a little bit down the table. But I think you have to start with, and again, my frustration on the Hill often is there's not a real starting with first principles of what, what's the problem you're trying to solve. And I really don't think, um, I mean, I guess I'd put it this way. About half of the Republican caucus on the Hill has a good sense of what went wrong 
why if you have the government underwrite risk taking, you get more risk taking in the mortgage market, and why these things will either blow up. The other half of the caucus simply sees this as a political problem they want to go away. And you know, I think you have to have that broader reach of how do you at least get a majority of Republicans to see here and say that having these massive guarantees in the mortgage market is a problem. And the solution is not just to try to build a better GSE mousetrap, but, but to not do it all, to, all together. So I do want to emphasize, to me, our ultimate objective, uh, and I guess I should certainly say emphasize it's not obvious. Obviously, I'm just speaking for myself, so don't hold Norbert or Diana or Heritage responsible for everything I say. But I'd like to think that they share my ultimate objective of we should be trying to get to a world where there is no Fannie and Freddie, or at least we're trying to get past that risk. And to me, the relevant question is how soon can you do it? And I'm not opposed to having a glide path where we try to have a five, six year period where we eliminate their footprint in the marketplace and try to bring more private capital back. Um, this will be a little bit more controversial where I'm going to step to next because sometimes there's a debate whether we try to be, rebuild a private securitization market. Um, I think ultimately what we need to go back to, and I'll mention a little bit uh, why I think we can do this without repeating the mistakes of the savings and loan crisis. But to me, I think we need to go back to the days where you know lender makes a loan, lender holds a loan. They need to sell it, that's fine. They need to do federal home loan bank advances, that's fine. But basically, you make it and you sell it. And I think one of the things we really lost in the crisis, and I'll use myself as an example, I think the five mortgages I've had in my life never once physically met a lender. Never. All done, phone, internet. And I know some of you are old enough in the room to remember when there used to be like, what, four or five C's of making a decision. And one of those was character. And so in my opinion, in the old days, a good lender was someone who not just looked at the ratios, but they had a gut feeling and said, is this person going to pay me back or not? We lost that in the Fannie and Freddie, what I call the factory mortgage model. And I do think we need to get back to a point where we bring character back into the credit writing, underwriting decision. Uh, and I understand some of this got squished out for good intentions in terms of fair lending. None of us are in favor of denying loans based on somebody's color, ethnicity, gender. But you got to have some subjectivity in the process if you want to be able to decide whether someone's a good credit risk. And I think we need to get back to that. So there is one reform that um, Norbert did not talk about that's in the Choice Act. Grant, there's a lot of stuff in the Choice Act. But I'll just mention Section 1116 is something where a lender gets an exemption from the qualified mortgage if he holds it on portfolio, which essentially aligns QM with QRM. This is also in the Shelby bill that was attempted to move in the spring. I think this would make a really big difference. I mean, certainly, I'm cognizant of there's a concern that, you know, does this help the large banks at the expense of little banks? But again, it, it, it covers everybody. And the QRM, which you are exempt from if you hold on portfolio, is relatively meaningless, in my opinion, if you can't get around the legal liability and the foreclosure problems with QM. So I, I see this as a step in the modest direction. Uh, and so partly one way you think about how do you get rid of Fannie and Freddie if you, if you, if you don't want to just pull them up by root, which I'm very sympathetic to, is how do we make it less attractive for lenders to sell to them? And conversely, how do we make it more attractive for lenders to keep their own loans and to be responsible for those loans? So oh, let me also say there's certainly been considerable controversy if you ever talk to any of the shareholders in Fannie and Freddie. They have very strong feelings about what Fannie and Freddie should look like. Um, there's lots of strong debates about, you know, the underwriting systems, human capital. Personally, uh, I know a lot of people that work at Fannie and Freddie. I think the uh, arguments about really important human capital there that need to be saved are grossly exaggerated. Um, but that said, if one felt there was value at those companies, the way to do it is turn them into banks. Turn them into bank holding companies. Let them compete on a level field. If they can survive under the same rules as Bank of America, Citibank, then God bless them. And if they can't, they go yeah. away. And, and, and again, and, and again, I think this is also a way where we're not screwing the shareholders. If there's value there, they get it. If there's value not, they take the loss. Um, I think for FHA, ultimately we need to move out of having that guarantee. But I think in the interim, or at least the path to doing that, the first step we should have is higher down payment, as you know, three and a half. And I'll also tell you, um, I was part of the team that fought to get three and a half. And I can tell you, just getting to three and a half was, was you wouldn't believe the yelling and screaming we had to go through Democrats to get to three and a half. I can tell you, that was not our first offer. So, um, you know, our first offer was like five. And even then, I think it should be closer to 10 in terms of what, what the borrower has to put in. 
I mean, I think you know this. If, if somebody can't come up with a couple of grand for a down payment, are, are they going to have money when the boiler or the roof goes? Mm -hmm. So you, you're just getting people into unsustainable situations, in my opinion. Uh, I also think, and, and this is a tougher question of how you draft it, because I don't, you know, FICO is a uh, trademark, and I like the people at Fair Isaac, but I don't want to create a monopoly for them in law. But where I'm getting at is I do think we need to think about a minimum credit floor for FHA. Um, and again, I don't think it has to be that high, but at some point, you know, I would probably say 640, 620, somewhere in that range um, is a bottom floor. I also think, um, and, uh, so one of the things that, that concerns me more about Fannie and Freddie and FHA today than it did 10 years ago is, as you know, FHA, Fannie and Freddie all have loan limits in which they're kept under. Those were relatively modest, still too high in my opinion pre-crisis, but the level of them pre-crisis kept their footprint in places like California relatively small. And California home prices are highly volatile compared to the rest of the country. The exposure of Fannie, Freddie, and FHA today to places like um, San Francisco, to places like Los Angeles is much higher. And again, you know, I have lots of friends in California, lovely place. And I'm going to apologize to put a little Econ 101 on you. But the way you have to think about this is supply is relatively inelastic, the way we think about a vertical supply curve. What that means is any one given shift in demand gets a much bigger shift in price. So when the Fed decides to finally start raising interest rates, the house, in price, the house price impact in Texas will probably be very small. The house in price in California will be big. And we are overexposed in terms of FHA and Fannie and Freddie in California, and as well as other high-cost markets. But that said, I don't want to just kick people out because they live in high-cost markets. I think the solution is actually to adopt what's done in the Rural Housing Service, for you who've ever done RHS loans, is it's tied to income. You know, the, you get a rural housing loan, it's 115% of area in income, median income is how it's determined. We should literally put FHA and Fannie and Freddie to work for middle class, not high income people. And the fact that you can get, um, you know, at the tide of the crisis before the loan limits went back, I think there was highs like in the 800,000s for, for Fannie and Freddie in certain areas. Um, that's not middle class. That's, that's people who don't need the subsidy. I'll say as an aside, a little point of history. Um, when we were negotiating here uh, with the House, um, there is no issue that Nancy Pelosi and Barney Frank fought harder for than raising the loan limit. They cared more about that than the trust fund. They cared more about that than anything else. They wanted to make sure that their very wealthy contributors and their districts had the taxpayer back in their house. And let me say as a broader issue, uh, I don't think we can make an effective argument for limiting government if we're not willing to start limiting the subsidies that wealthy people get. And big housing subsidies are, are, are among those. So I, I think that that needs to be an important part of it. Um, you know, I think also a recognition, and I'm very sympathetic, I'll, 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 maybe I'll finish up with a, a story. So I, my first uh, year on Capitol Hill worked for this guy called Phil Graham. I don't know if any of you heard of him. <laughs> he was a good guy, and one of the stories that Phil liked to tell before the crisis, or a story he told me a couple of times, was one year he was running, didn't have an opponent, had a lot of money, so he did a survey of the voters in Texas to kind of see what they thought, and I'll wrap up with this story. Uh, and so being an economist, he ran a regression and found out the number one determinant in Texas of whether someone was going to vote for Phil Graham or not was a, whether they were a homeowner. And because of that, he took away from that, let's get people to be homeowners. And I'm supportive of an ownership society. I think it's incredibly important. I think it's an incredibly important uh, builder of moral foundations and character. But I think we lost sight of it that if you don't put your own money in and you don't work toward that ownership, it's really not ownership at all. So let me, let me wrap up with that. So I want to echo uh, Norbert on um, how good it is to be here with you. I love the Sentinels, all of you. Um, and I'm going to tell you why. It's, it's because I've seen how important um, you know, trade associations and so on here are here in Washington. And they are, every incentive that they have is to become influential. So what that means is that they want to play ball with members of Congress. And that takes away from you know, the, the importance of dealing with what actual people need on the ground. And so you need to be that counterweight. And the more of you, the better. So thank you for being involved. 
Um, I just want to make also um, an addendum uh, to what Mark said about the amount of um, debt liability being held by taxpayers. What did you say? Trillion what? Whatever. Three and a half for FHA, right. five for... So I'm working on a paper now about um, the number of credit programs government-wide. There's about 150. You don't owe one and a half trillion or so. You own 18 trillion. And that's using the accrual accounting that the government now uses. If we use um, what's called fair market value accounting, it would be, you don't even want to know. <laughs> so um, just, just throwing that out. So I assume most of you know about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. You have a good idea of what the mortgage rules um, entail. So I'm going to just talk about a couple of um, recent developments that you should be aware of and um, poke the bear a little bit, and then um, we can, we'll, we'll, we'll get to questions. So CFPB's fifth anniversary was in July, and um, we've learned that as bad as we thought it was going to be, it's actually a lot worse. Um, going in, we knew that its structure and the extent of its powers were a radical departure from what um, you know, the, the consumer finance regime had been for many years. I mean, we, it's Orwellian, frankly. I mean, when, when, you, when the government begins to treat loans as the responsibility of the lender as opposed to the borrower, um, you know, we've turned a corner, a weird corner. And so, um, ultimately, that's going to catch up with us, I think. Um, the other thing that is, is troubling is the, the degree of abuse that the agency engages in, both in terms, not in, both, in terms of its regulatory, its supervisory, and its enforcement um, mechanisms. For example, the, um, the fine that's being, the Wells Fargo fine, um, five million of that fine is going to go to <coughs> the credit or the, um, the the folks who have the accounts, the account holders. A hundred million is going to go to CFPB, and that's what they're in business of doing, essentially collecting as much money and power as they can. Um, it was specifically structured and engineered to evade all the checks and balances. Uh, that all the other regulatory agencies fall under. The other thing that really bugs me about CFPB is its embrace of this sort of behavioral economic theory, which basically holds that you all are too stupid to manage your own affairs, and therefore um, Elizabeth Warren has to do it for you, right? Um, that's where we get to this um, ability to repay model and increasingly be it in um, credit cards, small amount, small amount loans, um, mortgaging, any consumer financial product out there, that's the approach that we're ending up with. So I want to talk for a minute about uh, PHH Corp. Are many of you familiar with that? Okay. Anybody from there here? No. Okay. Uh, if you were, I'd give you a standing ovation, um, as far as I'm concerned. Unlike most of the other corporations that have become entangled with CFPB and an enforcement action, PHH actually refused uh, to bend over, so to speak. Um, and for that, they, they deserve our, our applause. Um, they have amounted an aggressive challenge to CFPB, both in terms of the um, substance of the enforcement action and the constitutionality of CFPB itself. And it's the case, as you may know, is now pending in the U.S. Uh, Circuit Court of Appeals for D.C. Circuit, and a decision is imminent sometime this fall. Um, CFPB's disdain for due process in this case is stunning to me. And um, they are, it, it also I think reflects just how hypocritical they are because so much of the time they spend um, 
excoriating financial institutions for their lack of, of um, you know, care of, of consumers. And CFPB itself treats its constituency, um, you know, with, with no concern for its due process rights or anything, or its, you know, constitutional functions at all. Um, the Bureau, in this case, unilaterally reinterpreted the RESPA, and then they went after PHH retrospectively uh, for violating the new interpretation. Um, and Richard Cordray reversed a $6.4 million fine and made it $109 million, most of which would end up in CES, CFPB coffers. The case is really important on several levels. Um, but if one, it tests a reading of RESPA by Cordray um, that's contrary to the law and the previous interpretations by HUD. It tests whether RESPA, um, an administrative action, is subject to a statute of limitation. What couldn't be subject to a statute of limitation? Murder, I understand, right? First degree murder. But a, an interpretation of RESPA? That's kind of crazy. Um, and finally, it'll address whether the claim of PHH, um, whether the structure of the CFPB is in fact constitutional. And the reason that that's at, it's at issue is because this enforcement, supervisory, and effectively legislative powers are all um, centralized in the hands of Richard Cordes. And he is not effectively overseen by the executive branch or the legislative branch. And so he is a rogue, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that, that's just not a, a constitution. That's just can't withstand constitutional scrutiny, I think. Okay, so I also want to make you aware of a proposed rule that was recently finalized. And that's what the front page of the Federal Register is that you got. Um, what this rule, there was no announcement of the rule, and it directly violates the explicit language of Dodd-Frank. And what it would do is it would expand the uh, discretion of the Bureau to share confidential supervisory information with basically anyone the Bureau wanted, including foreign governments. Whoa. So what this means is that the Bureau, at its own discretion, could come in as the supervisor and, get, and look in your books and pull out any information in, your, in terms of your policies and practices, and then they could share that information with whomever they want. Now, right now, they're limited to sharing that information with attorneys general and agencies that are also um, have regulatory authority over you. That kind of makes sense. But to say that CFPB should have discretion to share that info with anybody, including foreign governments, is an invitation for the Bureau to use leverage against you on any matter it chooses by holding up your proprietary information um, as, a, as, a, as a leverage. So this is a dangerous proposal. I encourage you all to uh, do whatever you can to make it known and to get people to, um, you know, uh, comment against it and to whip up as much frenzy as you can. Okay. Um, so, you know, we have, we have a new ele an election coming up. What can, what can um, we expect from a new administration? Um, unfortunately, the answer is nothing because a, a new president, a new White House, a new executive has no power, basically, over CFPB. Nor does um, Congress, unless it chooses to, um, you know, rescind Ch Title Ten and, and rewrite it, and that's that's where we've got to go. So let's go to questions. You know, I, I think that's probably more useful than me, you know, running through a bunch of, of other stuff. But yeah, thank you, panelists. I, I had a list of questions I wanted to ask, but we're going to get straight to you guys because we're running out of time. Um, please. If you could state your name, where you're from, and where you work, the last one being optional, um, <laughs> the CFPB might be listening, so. <laughs> oh, I hope they hire. <laughs> Tom.
Todd Hathorne, NMLS number 196674, <laughs> in case they're listening. So uh, I've listened carefully, and actually Mr. Cooper Smith and I have exchanged discussions about the goal, which is home ownership. And what's odd is that this discussion stems from Washington pushing out. And the real problem is we need information coming back. We need action at the local level. And I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm here. I'm not throwing rocks from the outside. As a mortgage lender, I'm, I am very interested in making sure the CFDB stays out of our, stays out of our kitchen. Um, traveling the state of New Mexico, we have community banks that are completely disengaged from the community. It is a serious problem because there's capital on the sidelines. The only place that they'll lend is in safe um, commercial, com commercial investments, and that's it. So there's a lot of tied up capital in those community banks that I think should be. So I really appreciate the discussion about tying the lender and the borrower back together again without the, the, the interpretation. Um, I, I, I take umbrage with the discussion, with all due respect, Mr. Calabria, um, about the uh, scoring system. Second point is, is the scoring system to me is there are a lot of people who suffer at the hands of the credit bureaus, even though Fair Credit, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, et cetera, allow you to make those changes. The real problem is that if we would just stop picking winners and losers and let the capital market work with the goal of the government setting the table for home ownership but not deciding who is and isn't, I think that's a, a, a the goal here should be to increase home ownership because as more people own, more people participate. They're treated differently by their local vendors. They're treated differently by their politicians. The political structure is actually stronger if we're promoting that. And that means that we have to let people fail. Just like the big banks. Right. Do you want to comment, Mark? So let me um, reiterate a again, um, your own money lend to whoever you want on any terms you want. Um, and again, I recognize that lots of people have had credit problems for things that have happened to them outside of their own problems. That said, you know, I think the, the fair balance we have under the Fair Credit Reporting Act is after seven years, that stuff goes away. So for me, I, I don't have a problem with saying if you didn't pay your mortgage, you declared a bankruptcy, that you should wait a reasonable amount of time to get a mortgage. We may disagree of what a reasonable amount of time is. I will say, you know, in general, you know, my read of the overwhelming evidence is the things that are keeping people out of home homeownership are zoning restrictions that make housing unaffordable relative to income. So keep in mind, if you can't afford the house, no amount of credit's gonna, gonna fix that. Um, so it's just not clear to me. I think all the things we've done mortgage-wise have not gotten us there. I, you know, put it this way, home ownership rates today are where they were in the mid-60s. So before Fannie and Freddie ever did securitization, before we ever engaged in reductions in down payment, we spent the last 50-some years, in my opinion, just digging in the mud. So what I would say is maybe we don't know what, what will work, but I'm fairly certain that what we have been doing did not work. Uh, and it put the taxpayer at considerable risk. So that said, I'm very pro ownership. Um, I think people should be able to be homeowners. I think we shouldn't be privatizing as much public housing as we can, for instance. We should be getting the government out of this. Um, but again, I think we need to be, we need to take a very hard objective look on what's effective and what is not effective. And I'll just end with saying, our home ownership policies policies in Washington are predominantly not home ownership policies, they're mortgage policies. You know, and I'll put it this way, before 1960, the majority of homeowners, the majority owned their homes free and clear. That is home ownership. Any more questions? with all 
hate hacking and issues you've been having in government lately. Has anybody, again, they're not under any, they're not under any, um, you know, they're under the Fed, so they're, you know, wild, wild west for them. So who's protecting all that Humda data collection that they're going to have, and who's to say Russia, China, all the whiz kids on the hacking aren't going to, you know, have availability to, you know. So I just didn't know if anybody's ever thought of that. And well, that space. Yeah. There, I mean, the federal government has standards for the protection of, um, you know, um, citizen information. And, uh, but, we've, you know, there have been a number of major breach, security breaches in, you know, huge data, citizen data, data sets. Um, so, in effect, you know, there isn't um, anybody wa <laughs> watching that. I mean, there are standards that they're supposed to, you know, engage in and so on. Um, I do worry about security, but I worry less about security than I worry about uh, CFPB's um, going so beyond the um, allowable limits of what they're what they should be collecting. I mean, a, a lot of what's in um, Humda now, what they're you know going to start collecting now is way beyond what Congress um, intended for them to have. And the, and the other thing that CFPB has been successful doing, primarily because nobody's watching, is that you know in the in the federal government, if you want to collect information, you have to put in, you have to apply to. OMB to ask for clearance to be able to, you know, collect this specific information. CFPB is submitting um, basically general requests for information collections that, to cover a broad range rather than very specific and narrow information, which is what they're supposed to do. And so it's OMB that and the, and the White House that's giving them this unconstrained authority to collect all this information. They will tell you they can't identify individuals, but that's bunk. I mean, you know, it doesn't take much to, you know, um, match up a couple elements of the data set and, you, and they can tell, you know, where you're standing in your kitchen. So, you know, it is, a, it's very, it's, it's a big concern. Let me, let me just add on that. Um, people have actually already done studies, and as many as you know, if a mortgage is recorded, a sale is recorded, there's often courthouse records that are now often online. And so people have already shown that you can decode Humda data by matching it to courthouse data based on the census track. So you can already see through that today. And quite frankly, you know, the House had a hearing on it, I guess about six months ago, a year ago. CFPB doesn't care. They don't want any restrictions on their data collection ability. Just one quick add which is that it also enables them to a very precise degree, um, you know, follow who you're lending to, what color they are, what religion they are, what sex they are, if they've decided. You know, there's just sort of, you know, no end to the, to the control that they're going to be. And if they even think there's something, they can just show up and go, right. oh, we're going to find it. Yeah. And you'll know. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. So oh. um, I guess the question's for Robert. Can you expand on the fact that there it goes. Uh, right. expand on the fact that with uh, the Choice Act, if they're taking the banks out of the regulation, if they is it out of the regulation if they absorb more of the risk? Um, is it banks only, or will they allow that for the non-banking lenders as well that are servicing? No, it's uh, it's banks only at the moment. Yeah, and it. This is one of the weird things with Dodd Frank. You you didn't really have, at least initially, you didn't really have a banking crisis, but much of what's in Dodd Frank is a banking industry regulation. Um, and um, I mean, I I don't want to get into too much of a specific, I guess, the specifics of the bill, but I mean, I think the list could be a lot longer uh, of of things to let them get out of. Um, and, and it's, it's mostly just capital restrictions that were imposed by Dodd-Frank. It's mostly financial stability stuff. Um, instead of letting the non-banks get out of it, basically what the, the Choice Act does instead is it just gets rid of that, that designation process altogether, even retroactively. 
So any of the non-bank financials that were designated for heightened regulations, that's gone. Go ahead, go ahead. Sure. Mark, I have a question for you regarding FICO scores. And, you know, years ago, I'm, I'm, my name's Joe, and I'm a lender, so years ago we used to not you rely on FICO scores to make a loan. Probably when you met with your loan officer face-to-face oh, yeah. and we made more common-sense decisions. You know, it's to me, the FICO score, yeah, I'd say probably 80% of the time you can make a good justification on whether that person's going to be a good borrower off their FICO score and other factors. But... Three weeks ago, I guess it was, we denied a borrower that had a 721 credit score and approved a borrower that had a 639 credit score. The 639 borrower was infinitely more equipped to own that house than the 721. So if we rely on that entirely, we lose that ability to make loans that make common sense. And there were, and I know the 640 line makes a lot of sense most of the time, but if we're sticking to a tried and true and a whole fast line, we lose that ability to make loans on accounts. And, and so let me say, I, I, I fully agree with the, the, the point you're making, and this is why I think we have to unwind this sort of Fannie and Freddie assembly line model, because the assembly line securitization model where the taxpayers on the hook and nobody's watching the store ends up having all this micromanagement from Washington. Again, um, if we go back to, you know, George Bailey and you want to make the loan and hold it, you make whatever loan you want that meets whatever requirements you want, uh, subject to, of course, if the regulator comes in and gives you a hard time. But, you know, you're in this world where as long as Washington is on the hook and writing the check, Washington's going to dictate to you arbitrary standards. And the only way to ultimately get past those arbitrary standards, which are there because Washington eliminates the incentive since nobody actually bears a loss except the taxpayer. So to me, this is, one, again, one of the reasons why I want to go back to a world where lenders make those loans. Now, if you happen to be a broker or a mortgage banker, you can still make those loans and sell them to somebody else, and they can set up their standards. Um, but I think as long as we're in a massive, and again, I want to emphasize, any of the restrictions I've talked about in terms of FICO, in terms of down payment, would solely apply to FHA, and Fannie, and Freddie. Anybody else who wants to make those loans in any form, I'm fine. Taxpayers on the hook, do what you want. Well, I'm sure they'll stay up here for more questions if you guys have them. Let's thank our panelists one more time. We're in a break right now, so feel free to stretch your legs, go outside, talk to the panel.